Okay, well, I think we've hit the magic 30, so maybe we'll start. So it's a pleasure today to welcome virtually uh, Jay Strader, who's Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Michigan State University in Lansing, which for those of you not familiar with Michigan, that's in the palm of the mitten. Um, Jay got his uh, bachelor's degree in 2001 from Duke University and then his PhD in astronomy and astrophysics at UC Santa Cruz in 2007, working with Gene Brody. And those of you that know Gene mean that work, he worked on globular clusters. Um, then he was a Hubble Fellow and Menzel Fellow at Harvard for five years. And then he joined the faculty at Michigan State in 2012, where he's been ever since. Uh, Jay's worked uh, on all kinds of topics related to globular clusters, dynamics, abundance, star formation history, using them as probes of external galaxies, studying the globular clusters themselves. Um, then he got interested in looking for intermediate mass black holes using radio, optical, x-ray, and everything else. So it was a big part of the VLA Maverick survey for uh, radio sources and globular clusters. Uh, if you're interested in intermediate mass black holes, there's a wonderful 2020 annual astronomy and astrophysics review by Jay and collaborators on low mass galaxies and globular clusters and the hunt for intermediate mass black holes in those locations. Um, and then since there weren't a whole lot of intermediate mass black holes turning up in the radio through X-ray, but there were a lot of millisecond pulsars turning up in the radio and X-ray and globular clusters, especially among the Fermi gamma ray sources, uh, Jay got into that business. Um, he was awarded a Packard Fellowship in 2015, a Scilog Fellowship in 2018. And along with his AK-47, he represents the Milky Way in the LSSD Rubin Survey Cadence Optimization War, I mean, committee. Uh, <clears throat> so um, Jay is a particular fan, I should mention, of the genus Capra, as in the star Capella, the she-goat in the constellation of Capricornus, which has a nice globular cluster M30. Um, and he'll tell us today about the, the work on, started in the globular clusters, but now is everywhere in the galaxy on interesting millisecond pulsars and Fermi gamma ray counterparts. Uh, if you have short questions, go ahead and ask them during the talk. If you have lots of questions or long questions, please wait to the end and then use the Zoom, raise your hand, and I'll try to moderate the questions. So, Jay, don't fear the spiders. Thanks so much for that introduction. Yes, this is the uh, the only topic I work on that is not fully globular cluster centered, although the objects that I talk about are also found in globular star clusters. So just at the outset, I want to highlight the junior people that have made big contributions to this work. So uh, Sam Swayhard, who is a, a student in my group, just got his PhD last year and is now a fellow at Naval Research Lab. Jessie Miller, who just got her bachelor's from Michigan State and will be starting at Caltech as a grad student in the astronomy department in just a few months. And Shion Andrew, who is a summer student at Michigan State, and she's now just taken a Churchill Fellowship to Cambridge this year. All right, so new insights from red back millisecond pulsars. Millisecond pulsars, what are we talking about? So I just wanna go through the basic outline of how we think millisecond spinning pulsars form. So we've got a massive primary star, massive enough that it's gonna give us a neutron star. So let's say eight solar masses or so, and then a low mass secondary star. Now, if you've got a more massive secondary, you can get much more exotic things. Maybe you can make two neutron stars that'll eventually merge, but today we'll just be talking about the less massive secondary stars. Probably you've got to bring these stars pretty close together. Typically people say that's done through a common envelope, something we don't understand all that well, but let's say that happens. Then you get a supernova, boom, you make a neutron star and you've got a neutron star, maybe left over in a binary with this low mass star. Maybe it got ejected and went off into space. That happens a fair amount of the time. But let's say it stood, stayed bound. Now you have a detached compact binary where you've got a nice neutron star here which is spinning down from its initial fast spin. And then you've got this little friend here that's just chilling, not doing very much. But over time, of course, that friend will evolve and eventually overflow its Roche lobe if the period of the binary starts low enough. And this Roche lobe overflow can happen at many different stages of the binary. It can happen you know, on the uh, AGB, it can happen on the red giant branch, right? If we think that is one of the more common cases, or it can even happen on the main sequence. And we're going to be talking about both of those cases today. When that happens, that's going to you know, form an accretion disk, probably around this neutron star. 
and then neutron star is going to accrete matter and you're going to spin that central neutron star back up to a very high spin rate where how much it gets spun up and how much more mass it grows depends on you know, the details of how that mass transfer occurred. And we'll talk about that some too. And what you're left with rather than a regular star is the little core of the star that you had before. And if it was a red giant branch star when this happened, you get left with a little helium white dwarf core, right? Something which thus a single star would not form you know, over any no uh, normal time period over the age of the universe. So. Uh, we also know that you form millisecond pulsar binaries in globular clusters through a variety of channels, right? Since globular clusters make up only 0.25% of the mass of the Milky Way, but make up a third of the millisecond pulsars, right? Anything you do in the field, you've got to do totally independently and separately at a very high rate in globular clusters. But since that really doesn't tell us that much about how they formed, it's a totally different thing. We're not mostly going to be talking about globular clusters today. So I know, right, many people have come here and given you talks about millisecond pulsars, so we're not going to you know, uh, belay this area of it too much, right? This is the way we get the most precise neutron star mass measurements, right? They are gonna constrain, and we'll talk about this today, really the physics of stellar and binary evolution in a bunch of interesting ways. Um, if you've had talks about nanograv, right? This is, right, the ways in which we get this amazing celestial array that hopefully will allow us to eventually detect low frequency gravitational waves for mergers of supermassive black holes. And then, right, you have this sort of golden thing down here where eventually someday someone will find a pulsar in orbit around a normal or supermassive black hole. And this will give us soar many, many beautiful tests of GR among other things. Um, but we don't have one of those yet. So what do we know about the senses of millisecond pulsars? Well, actually there are very close to 365 radio millisecond pulsars known where if you define here millisecond pulsar is less than 15 millisecond spin period, there are many definitions. Uh, around two thirds of these are in binaries. Jay, didn't you tell me that we thought these all formed from binaries? Uh, yes, we think they almost all did form that way, but some of them have managed to get rid of their companions. We'll talk about how later on. And uh, contrary to what I told you, the counterparts that we see of these binaries are actually quite diverse. So we not only have these helium white dwarfs, we also have more massive CO white dwarfs. And then MS here means main sequence or quasi main sequence stars. So hydrogen rich stars that maybe have had some weird things done to them. We'll talk about those. So, and then also grouped in sometimes with millisecond pulsars are things that you observe in the X-rays rather than the radio. These are typically things that are creating at pretty high rates. They're called creating millisecond X-ray pulsars. Uh, they're very interesting to study, but they're a pretty small part of the overall population. So if you look at the function of how many millisecond pulsars that we know as a function of time, so I've plotted here, not going back to you know, the original discovery 40 years ago, but just starting here in 1999, you see in the 2000s, the number was going up pretty slowly. And then you can see there's a change of slope in the rate at which these millisecond pulsars are being detected. And you may already know or have guessed that that change of slope uh, almost perfectly matches the launch of the Fermi Gamma Observatory. And the follow-up of new GEV gamma ray sources from Fermi has really been a discovery engine for millisecond pulsars, especially weird ones. And this is something that was not fully expected to the extent to which it's happened when Fermi was launched. This has sort of been one of the biggest areas of bonus science for, um, for Fermi Lat. And it's not the only thing that's contributed to it, right? The you know, astronomers have been continued to bring along uh, new receivers for telescopes that you know make more efficient discoveries and even new telescopes like FAST and Meerkat are now making substantial contributions to pulsar discovery. But Fermi has really been the crucial thing that, in the rate at which we're discovering them, uh, which is now one new millisecond pulsar about every 16 days. That's the rate at which they're being found now. What I'm plotting here is a plot from the one of the original papers looking at Fermi millisecond X-ray pulsars. And what's being plotted here in the x-axis is the estimated spin down energy of the pulsars. And here is the gamma ray luminosity, right? The GeV gamma ray luminosity. The millisecond pulsars typically peak around one GeV uh, in their luminosity. And you can ignore the, the green and the blue points, but you're really just supposed to see here that there's a correlation between the gamma ray luminosity and the spin down luminosity, right? The gamma rays are coming from spin down energy. That's not that surprising. What is surprising is that the efficiency is so high. So 10%, on average, and with some it's more, of the spin down energy of the millisecond pulsars is being channeled into GEV gamma rays. And this is why the millisecond pulsars appear to be nearly ubiquitous gamma ray emitters, uh, and they're very bright. Uh, and this is just right, something that was not fully foreseen, 
and they have some big advantages over finding millisecond pulsars at, at other wave bands. Uh, and that's one of the main things that allows us to make these advances in, in uh, studying the systems. So what's the state of play of the sorts of millisecond pulsar systems that we knew about before this enormous uh, burst came with Fermi? So I'm gonna show you a diagram and I wanna spend a little bit of time going over it because this is gonna be a diagram that I'm gonna sh be showing over and over again in different ways during this talk. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is a plot of millisecond pulsars for which we know what the companions are. There are some that we don't yet know what the companions are, but ones that we know what the companions are. What's being plotted here is the mass of the companion, either the actual value if it's measured or the median value. And that's the value you get for assuming an inclination of 60 degrees, which is the median inclination that you'd expect for a randomly oriented population. If the only thing you have is the pulsar and you can't figure out anything about the companion, you just have to do it statistically, that's fine. It all, all averages out in the wash. The symbols that I'm plotting here these bulk of the population that we knew about back in 2008 before Fermi, most of these were these helium white dwarf companions that we knew about. Uh, we had a couple that were CO white dwarf companions. These probably came from somewhat more massive progenitor systems, right? More massive secondaries. We had a couple of weirdos that may have come from triples or been ejected from glob the clusters or made in a few other weird ways. Uh, um, and then we had a few objects down here that are at much lower masses and lower orbital periods. So this black solid line here is trying to give you a sense of what the model would predict for that simple basic model where you make these things uh, uh, during red giant branch evolution. And if you like take a population of sources, all of which started at different orbital periods, but have the same uh, secondary neutron star mass, this is what you get. Uh, if you vary the neutron star mass that you start off with, and probably neutron stars are born with a range of masses, if you vary the secondary masses, right, you can get a spread in these models. But generally, this is how it should go. You should have generally this correlation where the uh, longer orbital periods are more massive white dwarfs, and that is basically what is observed. Huh? So basically, we kind of thought we understood what was going on. Yes, there were a few weird objects, huh? these three objects here, and these objects became known as black widow systems. Huh? And these are closed binary systems in which, right, we think the spin down energy of the millisecond pulsar has in some way reduced the companion star to nearly nothing, right? Originally it was maybe, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 solar masses. Now it, you know, is a hundredth or less of that. Uh, it used to be, we thought, mainly ablation. So just, right, the pulsar wind slamming into the, into the secondary was what was doing this, was driving it off. It turns out that doesn't actually really do a great job of explaining the data and you kind of need to add in other things, for example, extended magnetic breaking to sort of push the evolution in a, in a different direction so all the block widows kind of more or less do a similar thing. But irradiation from the pulsar is an important part of it. And so basically that secondary star is dying after it's originally given life to the pulsar to spin it up. So this was likened to these black widow spiders where after mating, right, the, right, the, the female spider eats the male spider. So we think this process, however, ablation or whatever process gets these black widows, is going to eventually lead to isolated males like pulsars. So if you run this process to its conclusion in some fraction of the time, in a Hubble time, you can totally destroy the companion, right? And you're left with just the pulsar left. Maybe you make a pulsar planet. That might be a way you get pulsar planets, though we know those are quite rare. Um, but, you know, there were just a few of these things. They were fun to play around with, they were cool. There weren't that many of them, so right, who really cares? So that is, that's how things were in 2008. Uh, how things are today looks quite different. Uh, and so yes, as people have followed up these Fermi gamma ray sources, you've continued to pile up these sort of normal helium white dwarf companion millisecond pulsars. And you found, oh, here are some more CO ones, uh, but you found many more of these Black Widow systems. And then you found a set of systems, these ones that are plotted in red, of which we knew no examples in the galactic field before Fermi. We knew of some examples in globular clusters, but you can say, well, in a globular cluster, right, the pulsar doesn't need to have the thing that it was born with. In fact, almost certainly it didn't. So it doesn't really matter, right? That's just a weird thing happening in a globular cluster. But here this shows that this is something which happens not just occasionally, but all the time, right? We get these other systems. Uh, and right, what's likely is that at least some of these, some of these red things, right, these are called red backs, are probably the products of main sequence work flow overflow. So if you start off with a binary that is even at a shorter period, right, less than a few days, uh, you get Roche lobe overflow and you start transferring mass, not when the star becomes a subgiant or a red giant, but actually when it's still a main sequence star.
So the fact that there was a totally different population of these things that seemed to be much more massive than any of the known black widows had before, um, were led to the naming of these of a different class of things, which are called redbacks. And this is just named after yet another spider that eats its mate after they uh, after they copulate. So evidently, right, we were missing these things in the previous searches for radio pulsars in the sky, right? They were being hidden. Uh, and the reason they were being hidden is now that we've discovered a bunch of these things is that there's so much material in these systems. So, so much of the stuff is being blown off of it, which is a combination of the irradiation of the source and the fact that these are highly spun up objects that have very strong um, you know, winds that are, that are partially magnetically driven. Just means there's a huge amount of stuff uh, that, that eclipses their radio thing. So these are much harder to detect. And some of these redbacks that have been found only show up in you know, 10% or 5% or even fewer of the radio pulsar observations that people try to do to time them. So it can be very challenging to detect uh, unless you know that there's something there and so you stare at it uh, constantly. So most of these millisecond pulsars with non-white dwarf companions fall into these spider categories, and they're sort of divided at about 0.1 solar masses because it kind of seems like there really is something happening, right? This distribution is almost bimodal. I'll talk about that a little more a little bit later. And these things aren't just a star sitting there with the pulsar sitting there because you have this interaction between the pulsar wind and, uh, and some sort of an outflow or wind coming off of the secondary, you get very strong binary reactions and you can get both a radiation that you see in the secondary and very strong X-rays. And you can get you know, X-ray luminosities for some of these redbacks that are sort of approaching a solar luminosity just between you know, one to 10 kV. So these can be very energetic, but there's a huge range uh, um, depending on the relative uh, parameters uh, of the shock that you know, are really understood. There's another thing that's worth saying about redbacks, which is that Three redbacks, two of them in the field of one in a glob of the cluster, have been observed uh, to be part of the subclass of transitional millisecond pulsars that have gone between a state where there is apparently an accretion disk and a pulsar state where there's no accretion disk on very short time scales and time scales as short as weeks in some cases, though in other cases, right, they've stayed in their states longer for, for, for months or years. Um, and so these specific systems have taught us quite a lot about the end stages of recycling. They're very mysterious in some other ways. Um, if I have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about these systems. But I just want you to know for right now, redbacks, the only things we know that are these transitional millisecond right now are all redback systems. So there's an intimate connection between these things. Something else that's interesting about these transitional millisecond pulsars is they both have very fast spins. They're both about 1.7 milliseconds. So. And in fact, if you plot what the spins of known pulsars are compared to the companions, and these are ones for which the companions are classified, so for ones for which we don't have the companions, they're not plotted here, you can see black widows, so the black boxes and the red backs, the red ones, make up by far the majority of the fastest spinning millisecond pulsars. They're not just a random sampling of the, of the total pulsar population. Uh, how do you get these very fast spins? Well, you really need substantial accretion. And so what I'm showing here is just a plot of the sort of minimum amount of mass you need to create in order to reach a spin depending on the initial, uh, depending on the initial spin and to a lesser degree mass of the, of the neutron star. And so what's being plotted here is the equilibrium spin period. And here's how much mass you need to create. And you can see to get down to these spins of less than two milliseconds, you need to create a minimum of 0.1 solar masses which if you're doing it at a rate substantially below the Eddington rate, right, takes a very long time to do. Uh, but this is the minimum mass, and right, we know in a lot of these systems, it's certainly the case that not all of the accretive mass, right, the mass transfer is definitely gonna be very non, uh, highly non-conservative. And so the actual amount of mass you need to transfer is probably substantially larger than that. So what happened, right, these redbacks, these things that we, we didn't know what they exist, right? What, right, many questions arise about them. So. Where are they going to evolve into, right? We know, right, things here are not going to wind up looking like this in the bulk, right? Maybe a few of them could wind up in that, depending on exactly what their current masses and periods and mass transfer rates are. Um, are they going to become black widows? Are they going to go here? Are they going to go up here somewhere to things where, right, we, right, we don't see anything currently in that area of the diagram? Um, another thing, I haven't really talked about these systems at all so far, but you can see, right, there are these things that top out at just about a day, and then there are a couple of things up here, these are sources that have substantially longer periods. Periods are actually much more similar to these traditional um, helium white dwarf systems. So I'm not actually going to talk about these systems at all today, um, but we call these Huntsman systems, and we've discovered two of these 
including one that's been confirmed as a millisecond pulsar. And we think these systems are actually the ones that are going to evolve into these sort of typical things. They have currently, they have red giant companions that have been heavily stripped and more massive than typical neutron stars. They're quite interesting. I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about these weird red backs today. All right. So what has led to us finding these red backs and right, how are how we going to make progress in this? So our work here at Michigan State and with our collaborators has really been focused on two things. So one of them is discovering new neutron star binaries and unassociated Fermi sources, and especially trying to find things that would be very challenging to detect as radio pulsars, right? Because the eclipses are too extensive. And the other one is, right, if someone goes and finds a radio discovered millisecond pulsar, right, can we characterize the optical counterpart to that to tell, figure out what's going on? So, right, typically from pulsar timing, right, you get an amazing period, right? Instantly, you get a perfect binaural period. What you want to know is the mass of the neutron star. Uh, and so if you want to get masses of the two components, right, then bring in the optical data, right, can be very helpful in those cases. So for both of these, when you use optical photometry, optical spectroscopy, couple it with studies at other wavelengths to get the binary parameters. Uh, the main telescopes used for this are SOAR and for fainter things we use Gemini. And eventually we are looking forward to being able to use the Rubin Observatory, right? In my introduction, it was named on one of the people in the Survey Cadence Optimization um, Committee along with Monsi. So I, I would be happy to take any complaints you have about the Cadence, which has not yet been chosen for the LSST survey of your Rubin. So how does this work? So I'm showing you currently, this is the Fermilat 10 year map. So this is the most recent, uh, the most recent map, which was released. Uh, there's actually more than 10 years of data now, um, but this is what the 10 year map looks like. And what you can see is right, a very large amount of emission from the disk of the Milky Way, right? So this is mostly coming from uh, supernovae and other interactions between massive stars and the ISM. Um, and then you see all these little dots everywhere. The dots that are along here are mostly um, pulsars, young pulsars or other you know, X-ray binaries in the disk of the Milky Way, pulsar wind nebulae, all those sorts of things. And then out here, they're mostly AGN, right, which are isotropically distributed across the sky. So almost all these little dots are AGN, although a few of them are pulsars. Here I have a thing which is showing the eight-year catalog where the different colors, this is a very messy plot. But I just want you to say that if you look at the blue or red, those are the blue or AGN and the red are mostly pulsars together with a few other galactic sources. But all these gray points here are sources that were officially considered to be unassociated in the eight-year catalog. Basically, they don't know what they are. And almost certainly a bunch of them are gonna be AGN, but a bunch of them are also pulsars. And that's what our goal is to pick those beautiful pulsars, right? Searching for not quite a needle in a haystack, they're more common than that, but maybe searching for a needle in a pile of needles. So how do we do this? Well, right, if we could get the Chandra or the XMM tag to give us very deep observations of every Fermi error circle, we'd be done. It'd be super easy. Uh, so, right, the, the Fermi error circles typically have pretty large uncertainties, like some of the bright sources, the newer ones, right, maybe it's only a few arc minutes, uh, but a lot of the currently unassociated ones are substantially fainter and they can be tens of arc minutes in size. So, you have a huge area to look over. Uh, if you had, you know, a very deep Chandra image of the area, you just say, oh, look, there's a little blob here. That's the brightest X-ray source in the Fermi error circle. Maybe that's my counterpart. And if you went and, you know, got data for the optical counterpart, you might be right. But Chandra and XM data only exists for a tiny fraction of all the sources, right? There's a program to get Swift data for a larger fraction. Typically, the Swift exposure times are not very long. Um, and so they're picking up some of the brighter sources. They are useful but that doesn't do it alone, right? Um, Erosita, when it comes out, will be useful for getting the brighter sources, but many of the, the red backs and black widow sources aren't gonna be bright enough to be seen at reasonable distances, even with Erosita. Um, so you cannot rely on X-rays alone, although they are very useful. So yes, in this case, this little thing here turned out to be the counterpart to this thing, which is great. And when you have that, right, you're in great shape, but you don't always have that. So. So the complementary approach and the one that we focus in our group and have had a lot of success with is narrowing down the candidates in the optical and taking advantage of the fact that most of these closed compact binaries are optical variable stars. So, so I just wanna go through a few of the ways that you get optical variability from these systems. So if the amount of irradiation is not that strong, but you just have a very close, uh, a secondary that's very close to the compact object, especially if it's more of an edge on orbit, you can get ellipsoidal variations. This is where you have 
two maxima and two unequal minima per orbit. And the maxima you get just from the teardrop tidally distorted secondary. And then, right, just by gravity darkening, the day side of the secondary is the faintest. Uh, part of it, the night side is also faint, but if there's, you can add an irradiation to this, you can have lipsoidal variations for when the, the strength of the piece get affected by the irradiation, so you can get a very complex thing, but right in the simplest form, this is what the light curve looks like. Uh, if radiation is very strong, you can have a single peak per orbit, that's just when you see the day side, the heated side of the secondary, and as it turns around, you see the night side, it can be very faint, right, dropping to, you know, 3,000 Kelvin or fainter, and so it's very hard to see. This is just one example of a, of a black widow light curve where you can see, right, that the rate that changes, you know, a factor of 30 um, between the, the day side and the night side. If the irradiation is somewhat between those things, you can get a combination of radiation and ellipsoid variations. We see all these things in our, in our systems. If there's a disk, so the pulsar is not active, but you have a, a disk of some sort, like in these transitional millisecond pulsar systems, you can see optical variability that is mostly aperiodic. And this is just an example of a candidate transitional millisecond pulsar, where it seems to almost have some sort of limit cycle behavior. But if you look for a period in this, there's no period at all. It's kind of like flickering, but not exactly flickering. All right, how do you find variables, right? I'm talking to Caltech. People at Caltech know all about finding variables. Um, at the very start of our project, right, Catalina was super useful for us because it went pretty deep to V of 21. Uh, I missed the poles, I missed the plane. Obviously, there are all stars in those areas, so right, it doesn't cover anything, but we did find several using Catalina data, which was great. Uh, of course, right now there's ETF, and I just saw the beautiful paper just a few days ago talking about the ETF plane survey, which has fantastic coverage in the plane. So I'm sure there are redbacks hiding in that for uh, someone to go after. Um, of course, right, SOAR, that's our main resource for search prostates in the south. Uh, and so the fact that ZTF uh, doesn't go down below 30, right, obviously, breaks. And that's where Palomar is, um, means you can't use it in the south. Uh, Assassin is truly all sky, right? I'm a member of the Assassin Collaboration, going us to GM18, so it's really only useful for the brighter objects in our sample. One thing I would like to advertise, I bet some of you know this, but maybe not everyone, you can actually figure out what variable stars are in Gaia just by looking for ones that have large photometric errors for their G magnitudes. This has been true for several Gaia data releases, and DR2 is quite clear, and it's very clear in EDR3. So this is just showing Gaia GMag, right, bright things here, faint things here, versus the error listed in the catalog. And you look at things that sit off of this curve. Uh, these are either faint things that are very close to a bright thing, right, which make them have larger errors, or they're variables. And so, for example, this thing is a beautiful variable star that turned out to be a right back. Huh? And so uh, a student who works in my group, Sean Andrew, um, wrote a paper about how you can actually apply this. There was actually a European team that published a paper saying the same thing at around a similar time, except they didn't figure out that you can have false positives if your faint star is close to a bright star. So their catalog is full of of uh, things that needed to be screened out for that reason. So she did a great job with this project. Uh, and this is a super useful way for finding uh, variability. So eventually we'll get DR3, it'll release per epoch photometry, and then that'll be fantastic for variables. But for the moment, if you find things that have big errors, right, those are variable stars in Gaia. So they're just sitting there in Gaia right now. Uh, so just going through an example of a system that we recently published last year. So I'm showing you the three FGLs, so that was the four-year Fermi-led error circle in pink here, and then the four FGL error circle in yellow here. So you can see as Fermi-LAT has collected more and more data, the error circles shrink over time. That leaves less and less area. You start to box in your candidates, and that can be extremely helpful in the number of things you have to screen to go after. If I just plot on these two things, what the Gaia things, that if you go through that Gaia thing, you say, which are the variable stars in it, it says these four, orange things have evidence of being candidate variable stars. And in fact, this one here, which is one of the closest things to the center of the three FGL and is the only one of these variables within this smaller four FGL error circle is the counterpart to the Fermi uh, object. Uh, so we got extensive SOAR spectroscopy and, and photometry follow-up of this object. Uh, so you can see, for example, you see a strong change in what the spectrum of the star looks like, depending on whether you're looking at the hotter side, the side that's partially irradiated, or the cooler side of the star. This is cooler and this is warmer. And the rate of velocity is for this particular system, right? If you work out what it implies in terms of the mass of the unseen neutron star, you get not an, a, a best estimate of the masses wing 1.4 solar masses. You get a minimum mass of 1.4 solar masses. So that's what you get if the secondary had a mass of zero 
and it was exactly edge on, right? Perfectly edge on for 90 degrees. So you can actually get some constraints on the inclination by modeling the lake curve. And that's actually what um, my student Sam did here. So here's his modeling of the G and I band lake curves from SOAR for this system that has a period of about 0.29 days. And it suggests the neutron stars are likely massive, you know, around 1.7 solar masses or more, but we really need to detect the pulsar in the system. So we published the system, right? We're working with people to help get a to, to pulsar follow-up of the system. But this is one where, right, once you detect the pulsar, then you can figure out what the mass ratio is. And then you have a substantially better constraint on what the mass of the, of the neutron star is. Huh? Um, so that was a relatively massive system. That's of course sort of a standard system. It's the sort of system we're seeing a lot these days, but just to give you an example of, of, the, of the process that we do. So the best thing about doing this, right, this, you know, being able to follow up all these Fermi sources and find new drawbacks, uh, is you're not just sort of picking off one object here and one object there and figuring out, you know, what's going on with the handful, making just those stories about them. You can now really do population analysis, right? You don't just have a couple of these things. You've got a whole set of them. And you can say, what are the trends that we're picking up in the data? What do these things look like as a whole? So right now there are 28 redbacks or, or strong candidates. So these are either things in which radio pulses have been detected and we know what the counterpart is and we know it's a redback or things for which, right, the minimum mass of the star, right, is consistent with the neutron star and they're sitting right at the center of a Fermi error circle and it's really hard to imagine what else the systems would be. Uh, we've discovered nine of these 28 systems and have done the, the, the main optical follow-up of, of a further eight of them. So 17 of these 28 have been characterized with data from our group in the last few years. So, so what have we learned from this population analysis? I just want to highlight a few results. So one of the results is about the mass of neutron stars in the system. So this is a plot from a, a compilation paper I wrote about redbacks a couple of years ago. And so this does not have every mass of every object and some of the masses have been updated in various ways since then. But the overall results of the population just really haven't changed. Uh, here I'm plotting the masses of the neutron stars in these systems. And here are the masses of the companions in these systems. Their names are here. This one down here, people like to argue about it because it's a massive system. So it has two mass estimates. Uh, and this line here shows this canonical, right? The, right, the, the mass of the neutron star you learn growing up, which is 1.4 solar masses. And you can just see that a bunch of these masses are just way more than 1.4 solar masses. Some of these are measurements. Some of these, the ones with arrows are lower limits. So these are just ones where we haven't figured out exactly what the mass ratio is of the system or what the inclination are, but we know it has to be higher than these values. So, um, and one big advantage of getting the masses from these redback systems compared to the Black Widows is while some of the redbacks are affected by irradiation, they're much less affected than the Black Widows from radiation because their intrinsic luminosity is substantially higher. Uh, and so when you deal with the Black Widows and getting masses for those, I'll talk about that in a little bit, you have to worry way more about, the, about modeling the irradiation, although you have to worry about it for all of them. Uh, so you've got these massive ones. If you actually do the, the total mass distribution, what do you get? Uh, they are consistent with having a mean mass of about 1.8 solar masses and consistent with having a spread of about 0.2 solar masses. Um, the number is still small, but this is self-consistently taking into account the uncertainties in the upper limits and, and lower limits for the masses where we have those. So, um, and so you can see there's not 1.4, maybe a few of the redbacks have the, have the lower mass ones, but most of them were either born with larger masses or have, you know, on the way to becoming, right, these pulsars have substantially created mass and become, and become um, become more massive. Huh? So I want to pivot from talking about the masses of the neutron stars to one of these standard plots and all you've seen before, which is trying to get at the neutron star equation of state huh? and just talk about where these mass measurements fall into this uh, information. So I'm planning here, right? Here is the mass of the neutron star and here's the radius of the neutron star. And right, if you right, have, right, if you've read about this at all, you know that, right, these curves showing different huh? mass to radius relations for neutron stars are only one of an infinite number of possible such relationships that you can write down and they all have uh, you know, uninterpretable names of various sorts. Um, and what I've put down here, right, this sort of orange band is what our current knowledge is, really the most solid thing we know about the most massive neutron star that has been observed. And that's this pulsar J0740 plus 6620 which has a massive uh, 2.08 plus or minus 0.07 solar masses that actually that's come down a little bit from when the pulsar, which originally first published. But right, this is a Shapiro delay mass. And so this is as solid as they come, right? It's, it's, uh, it does not have a lot of that, uh, a lot of the messy irradiation or inclination modeling you have to worry about um, uh, uh, for the red back or black widow system. So, 
So I've given that this mass a rating of plus, 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 meaning, right, it's amazing, right, it's perfect. Uh, this was one of the older ones, right, which had a lower limit of, of around 2.01. There was one that was very similar to that, that's, that one has actually crept down a little bit too, and it's now more like 1.9 now, the other one that was, that was uh, previously up there. So I've just made this little band here indicating where that neutron star's mass sits. On the next set of constraints down in quality, I'm gonna call these the question mark constraints. And these are all from modeling redbacks or black widows to get minimum masses. And you can see here, right, this one that people argue about is Pulsar J2105. This is a redback, sort of lower mass redback, but it is a redback system for which, right, two different groups have claimed a lower limit around, you know, 2.25 to 2.3 solar masses, although with larger uncertainties. Uh, you have this sort of classic, right, right, one of the first black widows that was studied, right, it still has this claim in the literature, right, that the, that the minimum mass is 2.4 solar masses, um, so, right, so that's also, right, right, a relatively high one. This is a more recent one, which I list not because it has the highest value, but because the claimed precision of the measurement is only 0.04 solar masses. Uh, and the reason I want to put a question mark here is because, right, to get these error bars, you should keep in mind that one degree of binary inclination equals 0.06 solar masses in these sorts of comparisons. So that's the level which you have to be, be totally confident that you know the systematics of your measurements um, in order to make the neutron star mass, uh, mass estimates at this level, right? You need to know things to be sub degree percent level inclination. Um, right? We also do this inclination modeling, right? The people, right, that work on this stuff, right? They are including increasingly levels of sufficient in their models. Every time the sufficient unit goes up, the, the inclinations change, right, by way more than a degree. So I think a degree of skepticism for all of these is warranted just because it depends upon the details of how you model the irradiation, right, which is very complicated. Down here in the question mark, question mark, question mark category, I'm putting the constraints from 1708-17, where I just put one paper here, right? There are many, many, many other papers looking at this, uh, but arguing, right, based upon what happened to the gravitational wave signal, right, right after the merger, that the maximum mass of neutron star can't be that high. And they set a 90% limit of 2.17. If you look at different papers, you get different answers. Some of them are uh, much more conservative and they would be consistent with these other values. Uh, but if you believe that value and you believe this one, then you'd be like, well, we're done, right? It's somewhere in the middle there. Uh, and it actually wouldn't surprise me if the maximum mass of a neutron star ended up being around 2.2 .2 or 2.3 solar masses. That seems quite uh, possible to me. The other thing I want to add in while we have this radius mass chart up uh, is I'm just plotting down these two little purple areas, which are the nicer radius constraints for two different neutron stars. So this one is published. This one is not yet published, but right, they're giving talks about it. And I, right, my understanding is the papers are going to come out about it soon. It is totally consistent, basically, with what the radius was for the previous one that they published, and which was kind of big, right? It was 13 kilometers. So, um, and so, right, you're, you can see that between this here and this here, you are really starting to narrow down the allowable areas of the of the equation of state and right with further observations you you can do an even better job huh? so that's neutron star masses the other thing i want to say just while i'm here is that stars are great right julian del Ken has this thing she tweets about all the time that stars are still interesting uh these right things are only a few tenths of a solar mass but they're nothing like normal equilibrium main sequence stars right there Right, all hugely spun up, right? So they're totally synchronized, uh, right? In these very uh, short binary orbits, uh, right? We see very strong evidence of star spots. We modeled likers of these things, right? They're highly magnetic object, uh, right? They're warm and more luminous to normal main sequence stars. Uh, so I think these things are an interesting laboratory for understanding what's going on with sort of uh, magnetic processes in very extreme uh, low mass stars and extreme circumstances that I think, uh, uh, I think it'd be promising for learning things about stars. What else about spiders? So, right, we knew about these black widows. Now we have all these red backs, right? If you look at this diagram, right, where this is in log mass, your eye is naturally drawn to thinking, it kind of seems like there is a gap there. And if you do the modeling properly, that gap is very strongly statistically, statistically significant. There really is a gap where you're missing stuff there, right? So this is what the histogram looks like uh, uh, in log mass. So you properly take care of the uncertainties. That gap really is still there. There is something, there is a gap between black widows and red backs. So where does that gap come from? 
Uh, and we're really, where do Black Widows and Redbacks come from generally? So there actually hasn't been that much theoretical work on where this comes from. There was a paper a few years ago that basically suggested the main difference between whether you were Black Widow or Redback was just the relative importance of evaporation versus, um, versus gravitational waves. And so, right, Black Widows were ones where, right, gravitational waves bring them closer to each other, one over evaporation. And Redbacks were ones where, um, where evaporation won because they had stronger irradiation. Uh, but there wasn't really an explanation given to why you would have a subset that had substantially stronger radiation uh, than another subset. Uh, uh, there are ideas, but I, I sort of feel like they're just so stories. Uh, just this year, a paper came out that, uh, right, that, that revisited this question of asking how you get black widows and black widows or redbacks. Uh, and so this is looking at a bunch of evolutionary tracks uh, and those little gray points that you can't see underneath, right? That's another same distribution of the black widows and redbacks that I'm showing you. And these different colors are different irradiating luminosities. So this is very high irradiating luminosity. This is very low irradiating luminosity. And you can see, right, you can sort of populate this whole range of the Black Widow track for if you just vary the amount of irradiation that's coming from the incident pulsar. But it's kind of hard to get to this redback range. And the only way they, they could substantially populate this redback range is if they turn this beta parameter, which was the which was the magnetic field, down substantially for these redback systems. Uh, but basically, just getting redbacks is just a less natural outcome of modeling these systems than for black widows. Black widows are, in some sense, kind of what you expect. The redbacks are not what you expect, uh, um, and I think that's why uh, studying them is so interesting. Uh, another thing, which I've not, right, which people do, just do not seem that interested uh, in, in figuring out, uh, is what the relative abundance are of these spider binaries versus the versus the more typical helium white dwarf binaries, right? We're now in a situation where these spider binaries are making up 15 to 20 percent uh, of the total sample of, of uh, millisecond pulsar binaries, right? These are not just like a side thing. This is not just like a few curiosities. This is a substantial fraction of the entire population. And so I think modeling to try to see what the relative abundance are as a function of the, of the right, how many spiders do you expect right down to these, right? Can, right, what sort of prescriptions do you need to change in your synthesis models, right, to get, right, this many spiders? Uh, uh, I think we could learn a lot from that. I told you about these three transitional millisecond pulsars, and right, it would be easy to fill talks just about transitional millisecond pulsars, which, right, we're not going to do that. I just want to talk about a few interesting things about transitional millisecond pulsars and how it relates to this other stuff that we've been studying. Right, so I told you three redbacks have been observed to transition between disks and pulsar states. Uh, I don't want to say they've been observed to transition between an accreting state and a non-accreting state, because it's not actually clear that TMSPs do actually accrete onto the neutron star when an accretion disk is present, right? It, it seems like, at least in some systems, something much more complicated. Uh, is going on, but there is a disk there. Um, and if you take spectra of these transitional levels of pulsars in these different states, right, this picture that you got here comes from, right, the X-ray and the optical emission that you see in the system. So if you look at one of these states in the disk state, you see these very strong emission lines. If you look in the pulsar state, you just see the secondary with its normal, a sort of cool system with normal absorption lines. Uh, the X-ray luminosities in this disk state are 10 to the 33, 10 to the 34. You might notice that's much lower than the typical X-ray luminosity for say a persistent neutron star binary, which is typically up at 10 to the 36 or more. So that's why this is often called the subluminous to state. And in the redback state, it can have a huge range just depending on how strong the shock is, but somewhere between 10 to 30 up to 10 to 33. Transitional millisecond pulses also show these very unusual X-ray light curves in some cases, where in time scales of seconds, you get this drop down to very low count rates and then drop back up almost just as quickly. You get this very strong flaring. Again, you could give a whole talk just about this very, very cool phenomenology. One thing that's interesting is that both of the transitional millisecond pulsars in the field, so these are the ones for which you can separate out the gamma ray emission, right? In the glob of the cluster, it's full of other gamma ray emissions so you can't separate out, but in the field, both of them are brighter when they're in the disk state than when they're in this millisecond pulsar state. So in some sense, this you know, GV gamma ray emission is still probably, in some sense, being driven by the by the the pulsar mechanism, right? The, right, no black holes that we know, right, at these luminosities, right, emit GV gamma rays, uh, and no normal low mass X-ray binaries emit GV, right? So, like, if you take a typical X-ray binary, uh, ten to 30, thirty-two, ten to 30, ten to four, most of them at ten to thirty-six years per second, they do not emit GV gamma rays when they have an accretion disk, but these two systems do. So something different is happening in the increasing disk 
for those systems. So now what's also true is that people have also found occasionally when you look inside one of these Fermi error circles, you see not a pulsar, but you see one of these disks, right? Something that looks like this. Huh? And so these have been mooted to be candidate transitional mollusk and pulsars. So systems that are in this subluminous disk state and maybe at some point in the future, they'll transition to being a red back uh, in the pulsar state. Although none that have been discovered that way, right? Have, have yet done this of these candidates, but maybe they will someday. So we find these things as part of our survey. So one of the ones, and this is a paper that I, uh, I just recently submitted a couple of weeks ago, is in a four FGL source, J0540. And what I'm showing here is an optical image of the field and an X-ray image of the field and the solid and dashed are the one sigma and two sigma Fermi error circles. Uh, so one sigma, right, you expect right about two thirds of the, them to be within that one sigma, right about, um, right, almost all of them to be within the two sigma. You can actually see these two circled things here are both Gaia variables that we found in this system. And both of these Gaia variables match X-ray sources. So sometimes you don't just have one X-ray source, sometimes you have two, and then you've got to do the follow-up to figure out which one is the real counterpart. Huh? It turns out in this case, this source A is an RSCVN star. So those are active binaries that have one evolved component. So one of the components is a red giant, but they're tightly synchronized, they're spun up, they're spotted. They show variability typically from spots, but they also can have X-ray and radio emission that's related to the enhanced magnetic activity because the stars were spun up. So we did follow up on this one, right? We figured out that wasn't the counterpart. Then we did follow up this one, and that one is the counterpart. So this shows very broad hydrogen and helium emission lines, right? The full half act of, of H alpha is almost 2,000 kilometers a second. So that, that's actually a value that's even more like what you see around typical black holes, probably suggests the period in this one is quite, quite slow. And when we got XMM data for this, we saw rather than that sort of weird dipping mooding behavior that you saw for the typical transitional most compulsor like J1023, this thing just flares. It's the only thing it does. For the entire 42 kiloseconds of this XMM period, it just flared over and over and over again. When we got optical data, we actually also found uh, evidence for these flares. So these flares are sort of quasi-periodic and sort of 40 to 45 minute time scales. They're not strictly periodic, it's just sort of quasi, right? Sort of like it's a cyclical process that's causing them. When you look in the optical, at a large part of the light curve, you also see very strong flares that are recurring on similar time scales. Uh, so probably the right, this is reprocessed, right? Uh, X-ray emission that's causing these optical flares. Uh, but you also see this overall wavy low frequency behavior on two separate nights. Uh, and that would be consistent with orbital variations on around a 2.7 hour period. That's not a confirmed orbit, it's just sort of suggestive, but it's sort of a short orbit, right? This is much more black widow like than redback light. There are no known redbacks that have a period this small. The interesting thing about this system is that we went back in the archive and we found Ogle data for this system. And we saw that the system became brighter at some point in 2013 by about a factor of 1.7. And when you look at the Fermi light curve for the same system, the Fermi flux appears to drop around that same time. And if you look at X-ray data taken right before 2013 compared with our modern X-ray data, it also appears to have gotten brighter in X-rays in the modern one. So we think this is actually evidence that this system may have actually undergone a, uh, undergone a transition too. So it'd only be the fourth confirmed transition. So obviously we need to do more follow-up and it would be great to, for it to transition back and be detected as pulsar. Another system that they have found that kind of looks like a transitional mill like pulsar, we haven't observed a transition in it, but it has the sort of characteristic subluminous disk-like properties. This is system J0427. What's fascinating about this system is it's the only one known to show optical X-ray and gamma ray eclipses. So here we see beautiful new star X-ray eclipses and it exactly matches up with Fermi lat eclipses. So the secondary in the system is eclipsing both the central X-ray source and the central gamma ray source. And you see these beautiful eclipses in the optical and actually secondary eclipses too from where the, um, the disc is eclipsing the secondary. The interesting thing about this system, so this, is, this is one we published a few years ago, is this one also appears to spend its entire time that we observed at flaring. And this is true in several different long X-ray data sets. Huh? So it kind of seems like we have two systems here that, right, they don't do the normal TMSP thing of going up and down. It seems like they just flare. Another fascinating thing about this system is it's a very strong radio source. We actually observed with ALMA and we tentatively detected an eclipse of the ALMA emissions. That's just the 
right? Both uh, the centimeter and the alma continuum is coming from an extended source, but the alma is small enough that it can actually be substantially eclipsed by the secondary. So it's actually, right, one of the first hopes that we actually have to measure the size of JATS in a, in a quiescent uh, neutron star low mass X-ray binary. This emission, the ATCA emission, did not eclipse at all, so it's clearly coming from uh, larger size scales. I just want to say, it turns out in a globular the cluster, NGC 6652, there's this very weird X-ray source that has exactly the right X-ray luminosity to be a transitional system, and all it does is flare. So I kind of think these flare, these transitional MSP type things uh, that are in this disk state, that flare, that do nothing but flare, uh, this could actually be relatively common behavior among these systems. Um, obviously, it would be great to see one of them transition someday and see if they really are sort of doing the same thing. And it may be the physics of understanding these systems where you just sort of get the cyclical flaring might actually be simpler than the, than the classical um, TMSPs, which I think, right, the physics is, of that is clearly much more complicated. Um, my student, Jesse Miller, right, she's the one who's uh, coming to Caltech next year, right? She led a paper on another recent TMSP candidate, which shows, right, a nice, weird, variable X-ray light curve and has beautiful optical spectroscopy. So, right, our program together with discovering these red boxes is also discovering these sort of disk systems that appear to have bright GV gamma ray emission. Um, so, we've discovered three out of the five candidate fields in this piece. So. so, where do we go from here? So, right, the known red box are still super nearby, right? They have a median distance like two kiloparsecs, and almost none of them are greater than three kiloparsecs. So, so, there are tons more out there, right? Because our follow up is mostly in the south, right? There are Right, the north is sort of wide open. And I am sure in right, ZTF data, there are a bunch more red box hiding, just waiting to be followed up. Uh, any of these could be the ones that right, sets a new neutron star mass record, has a weird secondary, provides another interesting constraint. But as we discover more, it also allows us to flush out the whole population to really understand where these things are overall coming from. And right, we're just finding right, transitional muslin pulsars don't actually, the ones that transition could be rare, but these things in this weird, liminal space between things that are really creating and things that aren't, uh, right? They're not that uncommon. Uh, so we really ought to find some, what, find some of these to, we ought to see new transitions, right? There hasn't been a transition uh, since 2013. So we've been waiting a long time. The future is even brighter, right? So with LSST and Gaia, right? You'll allow photometric selection of, of closed binaries. The other thing you get with Gaia is proper motions. And a lot of these neutron star binaries have very high proper motions. So for example, the J0540 system has a, uh, a velocity of above 300 kilometers a second at its distance. So that can be very useful too. So especially once you add this with all sky X-ray and radio surveys, we're gonna be able to ID a neutron star and I didn't talk about this, but black hole binaries in quiescence too. And right, we're gonna be very spectroscopy limited in the South. Uh, we really could use a wide field eight meter class uh, facility in the South. Uh, uh, people always talk about SK for, de for detecting pulsars, but right, FAST and Meerkat uh, are having huge yields of millisecond pulses already. Obviously, with SK, it'll get even better. So I just want you to come away thinking, right, there is this large population of these spider millisecond pulsar binaries, redbacks and black widows, that have these hydrogen-rich companions. Um, and these represent, right, not just, you know, random weird things, but some of the fastest spinning, most massive neutron stars that we know about. And this is a population with the previous you know, generation radio stories were just almost entirely totally missed. Uh, and so these are right, not just like a sideshow, but they're an essential part of the story of how millisecond pulsar binaries form, especially the most extreme ones that right, give us our, our, our best tests of, of, um, of some of our most cherished astrophysical theories. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Jerry, for a great talk. Uh, questions? <clears throat> this is Shri, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to make uh, two comments, Jay. Um, it's, uh, I've heard many people say uh, LSST and Gaia. It doesn't make sense. Uh, the photometric resonance that's hap is already here. You don't have to wait for LSST. And uh, because Gaia max is out at 19.520th mag. So you may want to look at a few ongoing surveys which are absolutely well matched to, um, <clears throat> to Gaia. And modesty prevents me from telling you what those surveys are. Right, um, Gaia goes down to 21.5. Huh? Uh, so do, you know, if, you, if you look at, uh, uh, my point is that LSST is mismatched photometrically to a number of things actually, of which Gaia is number one in my list. 
it's mismatched to many many uh, like uh, stss phase 5 in terms of uh, uh, spectroscopy so uh, it may be a nice advertisement uh, but it's not necessary i think where ga- where lsst will really shine is as you go fainter and you still want precision well anyway uh, and if uh, someone would bring ztf to the south that would be amazing i think that plans uh, for you know black gem should uh, because of covid didn't get on that's what i'm saying so i think black gem will actually be doing a much better job because it'll be there to be doing very high cadence all the sort of stuff you want to have and at a at a photometric resonance with uh, with uh, lsst sorry with the uh, gaia as well as with the massively multiplex spectrographs um the second one is also a comment which is one way to look at redbacks stepping out of a uh, neutron star world is that essentially it's a cataclysmic variable phenomena of neutron stars so all the issues you told uh, of course the, it's diff there are differences the accretion disk is not that powerful <clears throat> but you know for example the tidal locking and the spotting yeah that's been around in that literature for a long long time and they're very nearby so if you're interested in that sort of stuff nothing to beat cvs oh sure but right the irradiation right that drives you to totally extreme levels and right the disk right no no not disagreeing i'm just saying if you want to go to the phenomenon of tidal locking star spotting and so on um i um, basically the three phenomena they're the same one is low mass black hole systems such as ao620 then cataclysmic variables at the other end and then these redbacks they're very similar in my mind right well the typical redbacks right they don't have disks so huh? yeah so, no, right it, right it's only these tmsp systems that have disks so huh? yeah yeah i understand but i think there's always been this long standing question of uh cataclysmic variables and hibernation might be in large numbers and those might be the analogs of the, the traditional yeah, redbacks. Yeah, right, yeah. I'm just saying it's useful to connect this to, uh, I would say, a uh, population which has been extremely well studied for over 100 years now. Well, I mean, at Michigan State, we love CVs. So I, I, have, no, I have no issues with CVs at all. Let's see, Wenbin, did you have a question? Yeah, I want to ask about the uh, the maximum mass of a neutron star. So the one, so there, there was one case that you showed that is is two point oh eight, and we know that you know all these redbacks they are found in very nearby uh, distances. So what what's the prospect that you find? Let's say even higher masses. Is the how unique is this source compared? Is it the is it the extreme the most extreme case where you do expect a maximum amount of mass gain mass gain during the accretion for this system? What do we know? What's the unique uh, things about the kind of the binary orbital periods and the companion mass and things? And what do you expect even higher masses to be found in let's say if we expand to ten kiloparsecs? Right. So this one, right, this beautiful system, this is just over one kiloparsec away. So it's very nearby. Mm-hmm. Right, it's even more nearby than typical redback system. So certainly, this is by far not the limit, unless the actual mass limit is just above this. Huh? Now, the issue is what happens to the physics of the accretion once you get up to these very high spin values, right? So once you get up to these very high spin values, huh, right, it becomes very hard to pile on more mass onto these onto these neutron stars, huh? right? We see in some of these cases, right, it's like some of the transitional systems, right, you are not successfully piling in more mass, huh, right, at this point, huh? and so. Right, the question of whether what's the main thing that's competing is you're running out of mass to accrete or you just don't, it doesn't want to accrete mass anymore. I think it's quite unclear from the existing data, but the number of objects we have, the sort of the pileup of the high quality masses at just above two solar masses, I think statistically is starting to look real. So, and so think, go ahead. So you think that's just due to the inability of the neutron star to further gain mass? I think that the pileup is real and the inability of the neutron star to gain mass is a plausible explanation for why that would happen. Okay. That doesn't mean it's actually happening. And it could be someone comes down someday and says, I've got a, a perfect GR mass of one of these things and it's 2.4. That could happen. But I don't believe any of these. I just don't. 
I think the they could be right, but I think the systematics are such that uh, they could be wrong too. So the, I think when, I, another another point is that you know if you try to make the evolution of these systems to get the periods and companion masses right, you need to typically start with two or three solar mass companions, and yet the neutron star is only accreted you know several tenths of the solar mass. So yes. most of the mass has not ended up on the neutron star, and so. You know, I think it's it's not a question of whether the stars didn't have enough mass. It's more of whether twenty percent or forty percent ends up on the neutron star that decides I its see. mass. I see. So that theoretically, it's uncertain at this point. So do I do I take away from this is that so this provides a very very conservative lower limit of the maximum mass, right? So yes. There are there are ways you can you know, and there are ways that actually neutron star can in principle gain mass without collapsing to a black hole. Yes. And obviously I'm not entering the realm of right, weird particles or anything or anything like that. So. I see, I see, thanks. Right. But right, if you go and you, and you ask, right, Jay, right, the gravitational wave event that happened that a 2.6 solar mass thing, is that a neutron star? The answer is no, it wasn't a neutron star. Unless it was, but I, it really wasn't. I don't think there are 2.6 solar mass. I, I, I don't understand uh, uh, when Bin, what you're saying. What Jay was talking about was the minimum mass, okay? It's not the maximum mass. That's a mass you need to spin up to a certain period, okay? But once you spin up to a certain period, then you can accrete mass with no gain in period at all because what really matters is the specific angular momentum of the accreted matter, okay? Um, so if for whatever reason, mainly the magnetic field, if the core rotation radius and alpha radius coincide, you're done. You can accrete infinite amount of matter at that point. Okay, so not a poor, forget the collapse part, which is why many of these millisecond pulsars actually, though they're not spinning at sub millisecond, they do have mass of two solar masses, which is a distinct gain of average of over 0.6 solar masses. So there is a lot of mass going around. And I think the fact is telling you that these things seem to you know, max out at two. The question is, are there some things in inefficiency which prevents them to go into 2.4? Is this the, some natural boundary limit? Or if they did, they actually disappeared from the millisecond pulsar sky, which would be a very interesting thing to work out. I, I thought Jay's point was that there is a kind of a propeller effect that prevents as the spin the, as a spin period gets really short, there is a propeller effect. That no, 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 it, no. It's very straightforward. Uh, when when so it doesn't. There are, two, there are two radius, right? Co rotation radius, alpha and radius. If the magnetic field doesn't change with the accreted mass, then you'll achieve a stable. You'll achieve a limiting period, which is entirely limited by your co rotation radius equals alpha and radius criteria. Mm -hmm. At that point, you'll simply achieve. You'll accrete more matter. But for every gram of matter you accrete, you still need to accrete appropriate angular momentum, otherwise the neutron star will slow down. And that's why at that point, you should look at the specific angular momentum. At that point, you're not gaining anything. You're just gaining mass or angular momentum, which is exactly equal to the star. So then you're just getting fat without spinning more rapidly. And that's what these systems are. I see. Uh, I think the, the related question is, you know, the other way to get it to spin faster is to reduce the magnetic field. And uh, of course, uh, yes. to make all of these, you have to bury the field. So the question of what stops well, but, field but burial, that, I think, is also well, interesting. Yeah, but still, if you reduce the magnetic field, I'll say more power to you, then you should get a submillisecond pulsar, and we haven't discovered them. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I, that's why I'm saying I think the in, one interesting question is why you can reduce it from, you know, potentially from 10 to the 12 to 3, 10 to the 8, but you can't get it down below 1, 10 to the 8. That's oh, because they have residual magnetic fields <laughs> still. Well, maybe, but you're still piling stuff, conducting material on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can recommend a fine paper to you if you want. Yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> okay, so any other questions? Otherwise, maybe we should declare the, the end of this session.